Downtown was so interesting compared to now as it was a bustling city. People were on the street walking in the evening. Uh, they'd walk to the restaurants, they'd walk, you know, park and walk and window shop and people just spent a lot of time downtown. The evenings were a place to be was downtown. And uh, it, it was just particularly like in spring and summer, everybody was out. That was the center of activity. Downtown Waco was thriving, uh, bustling. This was pre-expansion largely into the suburbs, so a lot of the commercial uh, businesses were downtown, your entertainment district, um, your, your theaters, the restaurants. Um, everything there was very much attuned to coming downtown and staying a while. Uh, if you were coming down to work, uh, you would take a break and go to the local cafe. Uh, if you were coming downtown to shop, you could go from shop to shop and spend an entire day downtown. Um, and you would make it a point to come down and spend as much time as you could. And so uh, it was a very happening place to be. It's a classic uh, setup, you know, they, there was the tornado at San Angelo around 2, 2.30 in the afternoon, the tornado at Waco, 4, 4.30, depending on whose clock you're looking at, and then uh, farther east, uh, over around I, what's now I-45, there was another tornado uh, towards sunset that day, so uh, it was a stormy day that you had this uh, relatively abnormal uh, high levels of moisture, and uh, there were scattered showers and some thunderstorms, and uh, and that increased in intensity or in potential uh, for severe storms as the morning went along and turned into afternoon. Sort of, I guess, typical Texas days when it's very hot and humid and still, and uh, but it was atypical in the fact that the cloud formations. Uh, were just striking uh, as the afternoon wore on. The, uh, the clouds were just seemed to go all the way to heaven. The stillness and the green hue of the clouds, you, you could tell this was just a wet storm coming. And the fact that it got still, you know, it's, it's pretty ominous. And you get that feeling when you, you've been around Texas long that something's about to hit. We were apprehensive and watching the clouds. It was evident that we were going to have a heavy rainstorm and probably high winds, but that's all we anticipated. There was a storm in San Angelo associated with this same system, but the people in Waco were being told, that's fine, we may see some rain, and at 1.30 that afternoon for the, the afternoon uh, papers, it still said, everything's okay, nothing to worry about. And so when the storm arrived, it, it seemed to catch everyone by surprise just three hours later. From what the people describe, it almost had to be uh, a high precipitation supercell and probably the, the entire uh, core where the tornado was, was probably obscured uh, by heavy rain that was being blown cyclonically around the, the tornado. It, it apparently caught everyone by surprise and I think largely because um, there was this widespread belief in Waco that no major storm could ever really damage Waco because they'd always heard from the Native Americans, the Waco Indians, that no big storm had ever come through the area, that they had lived here for many years prior to, to white settlers and that they had never seen a storm like that. And so they sort of took that as gospel. That afternoon, about two o'clock, my wife caught me on the telephone. She's a cautious individual and she wanted to know if I had heard on the radio that there had been a tornado alert. And I laughed, told her I hadn't heard it, but that it didn't make any difference to me because as she should know, Waco never had a tornado. It had been selected by the Indians, so we had heard for many, many years because of the fact that in all the legends of their tribe, there had never been a serious windstorm at the site of the Waco Indian village. Someone jokingly said later, yes, but the Indians left. The tornado that day touched down around Lorena at 4.10 in the afternoon. It went on a north-northeast track. It was on the ground about 23 miles. So it went through Waco and eventually dissipated up around the Axtell area. 
when it hit downtown Waco, that was when it was at its strongest. It goes down in the record books as the first F5 tornado, but that was added after the fact. So the Fujita scale that we rate tornadoes didn't start till the 1970s. But if you think about that storm, it likely had winds of over 200 miles per hour, about a third of a mile wide, and just cut a gash right through the center of downtown. That corridor was a major industrial and uh, business corridor. There were certainly residential buildings uh, in the adjacent areas around downtown, but it became such a big deal because it was largely wooden construction, but there's a large number of brick buildings, multi-story buildings all together. And so when you see a destructive storm like that, they collapse on top of each other and can almost domino. A lot of people were caught off guard by this storm. And a lot of people talk about just how rapidly everything changed. You're talking about just steady rain, more your general thunderstorm, then quickly transition to a storm with baseball sized hail. And then within a few minutes, it was a storm producing a major tornado. I noticed that the storm was coming in and suddenly within what seemed to me just a few seconds, but I'm sure it was a few minutes, everything turned extremely dark. I was unable to see across the street. Then suddenly it became light and looking again across the street, I saw that all the buildings had been blown down or destroyed. This frightened me terribly. You know, some people were worried. There were a few schools that even shut down early because of the threat of storms, but other schools stayed to their normal times because people had told them everything's going to be fine. Uh, some of the updates and the forecasts that afternoon. But the big takeaway you get from when you talk to people is pretty much the was you're going about your normal activities. And with it being at 440 on a Monday afternoon, that's a busy time downtown, whether it's people leaving work or people showing up to pick them up and really just the worst case scenario for that big of a storm to hit downtown Waco at that time. So the clock stopped at about 440 on the amicable building. Juanita Willis took a photograph of the clock, stopped at that time, 440, and it was late in the day, it was a rush hour. People were in their cars waiting for their loved ones. Uh, it was the, the busiest intersection in Waco, and it was the hub of um, the retail district, Taylor's, uh, a, a very, it, it's similar to the Central Texas Marketplace we have now, the activity going on there. Um, so, a busy day and it could not have hit at a worse time. Monday, rush hour, 4.40, just before five o'clock. You know, had it been the day before, it would have been very different, but the busiest intersection of Waco, you know, it, it, there's a lot, a lot of things to consider here. In school, on Monday, they let us out early because of bad weather impending. They wanted to get everybody home before the bad weather hit. Many of us didn't go straight home. There was a local pool hall down on Franklin Street that the kids frequented, and a bunch of them went down there. And I went down to um, Durwood Inman's motorcycle shop on Franklin. He had a place there to clean your motorcycles up and things, so I did that. And it was starting to get pretty dark and still. And so I mounted my motorcycle and went up 7th Street and across Austin and if you caught the light green you could on a motorcycle is a pretty fun place to transit through there and when I hit that hit Austin Street there was debris blowing in the air and the wind caught me it was kind of humorous I said whoa that was <laughs> what was that but I was in it and out of it so fast and I went on home had no idea what had happened and my dad came home. He'd been at uh, his place of business at 8th and Webster, which was right across from Katy Park. And uh, he came home with the car all beat up and the windows knocked out of it and he was pale as a ghost. And so I came back downtown and uh, found some of my friends and we stayed for the next 24 hours just working on recovery. At the time, Katy Park um, hosted the uh, Waco Pirates. The tornado damaged the, the field itself. Um, what's funny about it, uh, the manager of the field had once said that he complained often about the trains that run right next to Katy Park. And he used to complain about the trains interrupting the games and all the noise that it made. But during the storm, he saw something coming and realized it was a bad storm. So he dodged out of where he'd been and hid in the cab of a locomotive that was sitting on the tracks right nearby and rode out the storm in the locomotive and subsequently never complained about the trains again. 
principal kept coming on the loudspeaker at school telling us that they were having some bad weather out west. And I think it started in San Angelo. And uh, there was a possibility, but then later came on and said everything seemed to be clear and just to go about our usual whatever we wanted to do, which is what we did. Well, we had some parakeets and uh, we needed some feed for the parakeets at, from the Texas Seed Company, which was Fourth and Franklin. And so uh, my friend and I, after school, back then families didn't have but one car. Well, some families had two cars, but not any I knew. And so uh, my mother worked at a drugstore and I went, she had the car, so we went to get the, pick the car up from her and that my, met my daddy after he got through working and we were going downtown to the Texas Seed Company to get uh, bird seed for the parakeets. Well, before we got down there, before I even picked daddy up, it was getting bad and like that, People have said the uh, hail storm, hail was actually at least as big as a softball, if not bigger. But we had that metal visor on the outside of our car and it would just, you know, hit that visor. I don't think one ever hit the windshield and, you know, make a loud noise. And my friend Barbara was really scared and I kept saying, Barbara, I don't know why you're so scared, because the Indians said Waco would never have a tornado, you know. So and I, I just kept driving, doing what I was supposed to do. And when we got down there, uh, there was no parking place in front of the store. This is all parallel parking. So Daddy got out of the car and went into the Texas Seed Company, and I drove around the block. And when I came back, there was a place right in front. So I parallel parked, which I probably couldn't do now, but anyway. Uh, about that time is when it started getting bad, and Daddy was standing in the doorway, motioning us to come in with him. And um, Barbara was on the drive, oh, not the driver's side, but the passenger side, and she got to open the door, got out of the car, and the wind was so bad it almost blew her down the street. So Daddy reached out, pulled her into the store, and before I could move from the driver's side to the passenger side to get out, it happened. I never had a chance to get out of the car, which probably saved my life. When the tornado hit, all the debris, bricks and mortar and wood beams and whatever, you know, came down on everything and uh, came down on my car. But because of that visor, I think it broke the fall of some of it and didn't come into the car. But uh, well, enough was in the car that I had a lot of gunk and stuff in my hair, you know, so. But other than that, nothing was inside the car. It w but the car was, people said, how on earth did you ever get out of that car alive? Because the parts of the car that did come in and fall in, it stopped that far from my head where I was sitting. So I know I wasn't the only person in that car. <laughs> there was somebody else in there with me that stopped that roof from coming in on me. So immediately after it happened, it was deathly still and quiet, and people started coming out and walking over all that stuff up and down the street, you know. But there's no way I could have opened the car door. I did try it and couldn't because of the stuff that was piled up. But um, right after it happened, and those two men that came walking down the, all that debris on the street and got the got me out of the car, I ran over to the where daddy was and started trying to dig him out. And then somebody else, I, I guess I was hysterical. And uh, somebody came up and they didn't actually slap me, but they kind of shook me and brought me back to reality, I guess. I knew my daddy was dead, I knew that, because when I finally saw my mother for the first time, she said, where's your daddy? And I said, he didn't make it, he's still downtown. And of course, we didn't know about Barbara because I didn't see her since she'd gone up to the back of the store. My mother, she had to call my girlfriend's parents. And they knew she was with me, but they didn't know where we were. They didn't know that we, there was a tornado. They didn't know we were in it. So my mother had to call Barbara's parents and tell them, what, you know, your child is in school, your child is with her friend, and. I know my child is going to be with my friend until she brings her home, and then all of a sudden you get a phone call. Your your child is 
has been in a tornado downtown and they can't find her. I mean, what could be worse than that? Barbara, my friend that was killed, she and I had a lot of classes together. And when we, when I went back to school after that happened, the, the teachers had made sure that somebody was sitting in her chair and there wasn't just an empty chair sitting there in the classroom. I thought that was very thoughtful. One hundred and fourteen people died in the storm. Sixty-one died in that radius between Fourth, Fifth, Austin, and Franklin. Uh, and the largest number of fatalities in one place were in the R.T. Dennis Furniture Company. So it was built in the 1890s. Uh, R.T. Dennis Company moved into it in about 1892. And originally, it was about three floors. And then in the 1920s, they added two more stories to it. And um, so. Brick, wood frame, non-steel structure. It came down. It slid down, like we have here. And, and I've heard accounts where it just slid down like a house of cards. Just imagine five floors coming down on you. Uh, and, and, and there were several people that were killed. Life magazine showed up uh, within the next 12 hours after the storm to start documenting things. Uh, they came across the rubble of the RT Dennis, and there was a rescue effort going on. 14 hours after the storm had actually come through downtown. And one of the last survivors was pulled from the rubble of the Dennis building, that was Lily Maitken. Uh, she was a telephone operator who had, had taken shelter sort of underneath some piece of furniture, I've heard it described as a mattress or a divan, um, and had been buried in the rubble. And after hours of digging and searching and, and getting to her, they finally got to her and they took a hold of her, but before they took her out, they took her shoes off for some reason and sat them aside. And then these men got her out of the rubble and sat her aside and she said, don't lose those shoes. They're old, but they're comfortable. And she was reunited with the shoes at the hospital. She was one of those feel good stories from a very devastated portion of town. My father's name was Max Halvey. He was an independent electrician at, at the Dennis building. He, he, uh, had been, he was hired to clean up all the fans and hang them to get them ready for summer because they didn't have air conditioning. And so he was, he was just finishing up on the fifth floor and when they came up and said, you need to come downstairs. The, the, there's going to be a tornado. And he said, well, I just have to finish my job here and then I'll be down. And that was, saved his life. I had just finished my work and started to go down when the storm hit. I got to the first steps as the lights went out. I saw I couldn't make it. I didn't know any other way down, so I figured I'd ride it out. The top of the building was shaking like a sailboat in the wind, and it sounded like sledgehammers were popping away on the building below. Then all of a sudden, everything went out from under me. It seemed as if I was floating on top of the building with a ringside seat on a tornado. Something pressed against my rib and kept me standing all the way down. I didn't see much because I was facing the east wall and suddenly everything stopped. I found myself standing hip deep in debris next to the Joy Theater wall facing toward Austin Avenue. Right there, I stopped and thanked the Lord. It was time to. What saved me was the roof blew over into Fifth Street. And the way the wall collapsed, the bottom of the building collapsed first, and the walls beside me flipped to the ground from the bottom up, like a piece of paper sliding through your fingers. Everything seemed all right, until just after the wind passed and then the building crashed. Bill Watkins, who was killed, was up there showing some dining room furniture to some customers about 45 minutes before, but they all left. When it stopped, everything stopped. There wasn't a stick that moved afterward. I heard a man call for help and a woman scream, but I couldn't tell where it came from. I was about 20 feet above the street and dug myself out with my free hands. It was raining, so I stood under a skylight for a while to get out of the rain. 
I took stock of myself and found all my tools in my pockets. My glasses were still on. Only my hat was missing. My clothes weren't even torn. I brushed myself off and went over to the Tom McCain store to see if I could get a ride home. My wife and family knew I was at the store and had heard it was destroyed. When I got out of the car, they were shocked at first and then started babbling and crying. I had heard the storm warnings, but I'm an old timer here and wasn't alarmed too much. I thought it would just be a blower like the rest. What did I think about at that time? Nothing. I guess I was just close enough to heaven. So the damage we often think about to buildings just is a thought of something like the dentist where it collapsed in on itself, but there were so many of those facades on buildings downtown. There were essentially just piles of bricks on top of each other or wood that were attached to the building itself, but not super firmly or solidly sometimes, especially if it dated to the 1890s or early 1900s. So when the wind would come through, it would just peel them forward and collapse forward onto the street. Actually, cars that were parked along the curb were uh, mashed, crushed with brick down to a height of two feet or so. Uh, and apparently the wind, uh, the tornado had taken the false fronts of the buildings and just knocked them off and just collapsed the cars. And unfortunately, a lot of people were killed in those cars. They were waiting for loved ones to, because of the rain, they'd come to pick them up. My mother picked my sister and I up from school early because she had a doctor's appointment downtown. That was where the doctors were at that time. And we went down. The doctor took my sister's stitches out of her foot, but it was raining really hard then. Uh, it was bad weather by then. And mother said, y'all wait here under the cover while I get the car. Well, we did, we got in the car, and she headed over to Washington out of downtown, and it started hailing. The hailstones were the size of softballs. They were big, and we had a new car. So my mother said, I'm going to Doug's. Her brother had a service station at Fifth and Webster, and she said, we can get under the awning there. So we turned and went back down to Fifth Street and headed over to Webster, only got to the railroad tracks when the headlights would no longer penetrate the darkness. It had just gotten black. And headlights, I mean, how does the atmosphere get so thick that your headlights don't penetrate? So mother stopped as we got to the railroad tracks and we started praying. I mean, not knowing what was going on. And suddenly a telephone pole fell on the front of our car and the only injury was a tiny little scar on my finger because I had my hand on the dashboard. And about that time, the I think it was Easy Monday Laundry Starch building was to our right, and it fell onto the back of our car, and all of the cars parked along the curb. The doors popped open. It was an experience. And whenever it cl cleared enough, it was still raining, but Mother got out and said, y'all wait right here. Now the cars at the curb were maybe two feet tall because they were just squashed to the ground. It was something. Mother got her brother who came and carried my sister piggyback down to his station since she was on crutches and water was running knee deep. How people kept from getting electrocuted no idea, because the power lines were down in that water we were walking through. 
but I guess God was looking after us. So we got to my brother's. He, I mean, my mother's brother, my Uncle Doug, and he had a car and said, y'all can take the car and go home. God was looking after us. Uh, even though our car got badly damaged, it, we were not, we were safe. So the Paget building was built in the late 1800s, and it was originally Tom Paget Wholesale Saddlery. And the Tom Paget Company supplied harnesses uh, for French and British troops during World War I. It was the number one go-to place for saddlery. Wagons, uh, Clint Paget was a revolutionary, and he actually uh, sold automobiles in the 1910s when they came and vote. Paget's, as we know it, moved to Austin Avenue, then later, up until the 2000s, was on Franklin Avenue, and they were a technology company. So the Dennis Company acquired the old Paget building after they left the corner here. So this was the warehouse, and I would imagine it was quite top-heavy. You probably had some of the heavier furniture up top, uh, while you had the bottom area for cargo, so um, I would imagine they were top heavy and they were not steel structures, as we, we had mentioned. So the winds came, they toppled over. So that's the situation here, and that's why we ended up like the devastation we did. The tornado struck. We, we did not uh, experience within the office any loud sound whatsoever or anything. All we knew is we had, all at once the building was caving in on us. We were buried for three and a half hours. The nurse in the office was killed. Dr. Ernest Johnson received a severe laceration of his left hand and I received a puncture wound of my lungs. My wife, who always met me at five o'clock in the afternoon, and stopped that afternoon to help a neighbor catch his duck. And had it not been for that, she and the two boys would have been killed in the tornado. I was taken to Hillcrest Hospital. At that time, I didn't know about my wife and two children, and they told her I was dead. And uh, she was she's a nurse, and she was frantically trying to get to me some way. So it was a very traumatic experience. There was a doctor who operated out of the pageant and he would do treatment for cancer, mouth and throat cancer, using a thin radium needle, essentially. Um, a physics professor at Baylor named Bob Packard described it as being about the length of a pencil and the thickness of a wire hanger. So not a large piece, but this doctor would take it and insert it down into the throat to treat cancer. And so when the Paget building collapsed, um, he was trapped in the rubble, but he was rescued and sent to the hospital. When he came to, he started mumbling about the needle. We have to find the needle, because here's this large piece of uh, radioactive material just sitting in the rubble. So uh, Packard and two of his colleagues from the Baylor Physics Department went downtown after what was left of the Paget building had been carted to Fourth and Colcord and dumped into a crevice as fill. And so they spent a, a while at that site with a Geiger counter trying to find this sliver of radium. No luck. So on a whim, they go back to the site of the Paget building and the Geiger counter goes crazy. And so they know we're in the presence of some kind of radioactive material. They go over to a pile of what he called dust and debris, swept things away, found a string, pulled it up, and there's the radium needle. So uh, he said, we weren't around it long enough to get much exposure to the, to the radioactive elements, so we you know, encased it and got away from downtown as quickly as we could. But a literal needle in a debris pile in that situation, and, and very fortunate that they found it when they did. The Neely Paint Store was connected to the, um, the old Paget building, which is right here. Joe and Lucy Neely were the owners and operators of the Neely Paint Company. They died when the building collapsed, when the Paget building collapsed on top of their structure. Uh, they were found embraced. I just think their story deserves to be told. They stayed in the building and, and they died together. So on Fifth Street between the Paget building and the R.T. Dennis building, there was an alleyway there. And back in that alley was a, what was called the Torrance Recreation Hall. So that was a big hangout for your older teens and low 20s kids. And uh, the top floor had a domino hall. The bottom floor had a pool hall in it. So uh, that was a big hangout place. And as you would imagine, kids getting out of school, people maybe on their day off. It was a bustling place. 
unfortunately took a direct hit from the tornado. Estimates have it around 18 people died just in that one building alone. So we got an amazing opportunity from the oral history program at Baylor to hear multiple perspectives inside of that building. So we get to hear from Donald Hansard, who was a teen at the time, a senior in high school at La Vega, who was inside the recreation hall and survived. We also get to hear the story of the man that pulled him out of the wreckage, Claude Kincannon. Went to a place called Torrance Recreation Center, which was in the alley behind the old RT Dennis building. There were storm clouds, and we had heard of the warnings, but We'd always heard that the uh, Waco Indians settled here, there'd be no tornadoes away because it's kind of in a valley. The lights went out and he and I kept on playing between the flashes of lightning. I mean, we were happy-go-lucky, still didn't worry about it. I remember explicitly that he had made a shot and I had said something like I was very lucky. And I moved around the table to shoot another time. Of course, that's what saved my life. When I walked around the side of the table, the storm hit. It was like a big clap of thunder, like a, like a bomb going off, just explosion. Upstairs in the domino hall, the floor joist, which was above our head, fell across me and one fell on the side of the pool table. This kept me from being crushed. And my right foot was on Kay's left arm. It, the same beam that crushed my foot crushed his head. But I remember very plainly as I hit the floor, putting my hand in something that was sticky and I knew immediately it was blood. Of course, it, it found it was his blood. I bled very little. I fractured my hip and had bruised my foot. And I remember screaming and hollering. I picked up a pool cue and began tapping on the, I had about eight or 10 inches above my head and I began hollering and screaming and pecking on the overhead. So I'd been down there from 4.45 until nine o'clock at night before someone got to me. They cut a hole with an ax above my head. A young man the name of Claude Kincannon, he was the first that got to me. He was a better athlete, a football player at the time, and people have been in Waco a long time I remember him as being an all-state quarterback at Waco High. They opened this hole, and I can remember the cotton glove that Claude had on his hand, sticking it down through the hole, and I can remember grabbing a hold of both of his hands and, and talking with him. I owned a service station on the 25th in Franklin. At that time, the tornado passed down the railroad track and blew the car off the jack and me in the gutter. So being in the National Guard, I went directly to the National Guard armory. It was at 6th and Franklin. I walked out of the armory to where all the destruction was. I knew there was a pool hall there. I knew it was in a basement. And I used to go in there myself when I was in high school and saw it, how bad it was damaged. The whole building was just like you taking the walls out and drop the floors together. We dug with everything we could get a hold of, picks and shovels. As we started digging, we started hearing knocking. So we started digging towards the mop. His friend was laying right next to his leg with a beam across his head. And I had to bring Don up. His leg was pretty bad and uh, had to lay him pretty well across me to try to come up the floor. They got me out at a little past midnight that night. Took me to Providence Hospital. I now know that uh, uh, my life is probably spared to do something else, by the grace of God. I really believe that. It's because there's death all around me. There's really no other reason for me to be alive except for that. And those of us that lived through it always remember this of May 11, 1953. This is something that will save us the rest of our life. That was three days before my ninth birthday. Of course, that morning I went to school and uh, at best I remember, we got out at the usual time. Uh, no indication of storm or anything coming. And uh, I went downtown, my dad's pharmacy, there on 5th up to Austin Avenue, and went around, around in front of the dentist building and I guess Chris's Cafe and then the theater was right there. Probably got a little bored at the <laughs> pharmacy and asked dad if I could go to the movie. And he said, go ahead. So I went to the movie. I was on the 4th Street side of the theater, all the way at the front, first chair on the first row, like most of the kids, you know. <laughs> but Daddy always knew that's where I'd be, you know, right there. The movie started at normal, and I can't tell you how long it went, probably not very long, and then the lights went out, and of course the movie stopped. Well, that wasn't unusual then. So you kind of sit there and wait for them to fix the tape or whatever they do. You know, it wasn't dark there because they had the emergency lights you could see. After a little bit, I just got kind of antsy. You know, it's kind of like, this is taking way too long. You know, I wonder what's wrong. And so I decided that I would go uh, out to the lobby and got up and started up the side aisle and I got 
probably a third to half of the way up when uh, the ceiling came in and a beam dropped and hit the wall <laughs> uh, above my head and of course all the debris fell but it it didn't touch me and uh, after everything quit moving I just walked out and a lot of people were already in the lobby and there was debris all over the street and I still of course had no idea what happened uh, I was gonna go out the door and go find my dad and tell him, you know, gee, <laughs> did you see what happened, you know? And uh, a man who was in the lobby was a customer at the pharmacy. And he stopped me and told me, no, you can't go out there yet because you know, they say there's, there's wires down. And I recognized him, so I said, okay, and I waited. And when they let us out, he went with me and we went over to Washington and up to 6th Street and across and we got down to the alleyway between Austin and Franklin, and it was clear. So we went down the alley to get to the pharmacy, which was the second second place in from there. And of course, front windows were all gone, and he went in uh, to look for Daddy, and Daddy wasn't there. And uh, so they, he left me with uh, Mr. and Mrs. Stone, who had the cleaners there on the corner. And when he went back, Franklin in around a fourth and came back to the theater and found Daddy all the way in the front of the theater digging in the debris because he knew where I would be sitting. My uh, stepmom worked in a small loan company over there in the Paget building. She wasn't hurt. And I think her boss probably kept her corralled for a while because he told her when he realized there was probably a storm coming he told her to get under a desk. They had those big old heavy desks. And <laughs> she had on a new dress, I guess, and she refused to get under the desk. So he more or less chunked her under, you know, and probably saved her from being hurt because again, their windows imploded. I think it's absolutely miraculous that the three of us were so close, right at the edge of that tornado and, and I just walked out. My stepmom walked out, and Daddy, of course, was injured with it, you know, with the, the hit to his head. Some piece of debris, apparently, and I was told it was the head of a parking meter, you know, they were about like that, uh, was ripped off, you know, the, the pole and came through the window and hit him in the right temple. and. and being my age now, I think, well, it, it, it's a wonder that didn't kill him outright. But we all walked out. There was a moving picture theater across the street, Joy Theater, and they were going through the rubble to see if any people were hurt. And as they were moving the seats, underneath a section of the seats was a little boy. And they finally got him where he could move out of the seats, and they were going to question him. And the little fella said, for God's sakes, let me go. He says, when I get home, they're going to beat the hell out of me anyway. And it's because I was supposed to be at home working, something to that effect. And I thought that was rather, rather amusing. The little fella had lived through all this catastrophe and suffered no ill effects. He crawled under the seats and, was, and stayed there until he was dug up. But he was anxious to get home because he knew he, that he had something coming because he didn't obey what his daddy and mother told him to do. All the buildings were in the street, and uh, there was just debris where it never was before. And it, it had almost a line. You could see where the damage began. And as you walk down Austin Street to about uh, uh, 6th Street, it began to get covered with debris and they lose debris. But from there on down, the streets were full. And over on Franklin Street, pretty much the same thing. And all the way down to the square, it was like that. The, the square was different as most towns like Hillsboro, Waxahachie. You, you see a town surrounded a, a courthouse. However, this was referred to as City Hall Square. You had no, numerous um, grocery stores, um, markets. So it was your typical quaint town square around the City Hall. Well, the east side of the square, as well as Bridge Street, were, were impacted the most. 
Bridge Street was a largely African-American uh, commercial area. There were uh, barber shops and uh, pool halls and businesses of all sorts at Bridge Street. And that's now basically where the suspension bridge ends in the downtown side where the Hilton Hotel uh, is that area there. It sort of terminated in the square. That area was particularly hard hit. A number of those buildings were early buildings in the Waco downtown. So they had um, seen several generations of use, largely wooden, and so they just sort of collapsed like matchsticks through the storm. So uh, tornado went through Bridge Street, obviously, but the tornado also hit these two cable stay towers and did damage to the Waco Suspension Bridge. And the Waco Suspension Bridge was stuccoed over in the 1910s. If you look at some of the early pictures of the bridge, you can see the brick, but it was stuccoed and they did that for reasons of uh, protecting the brick against floods because Waco had a lot of floods. But I think without the stucco, perhaps the suspension bridge may not have made it or have been damaged a lot worse. So the, in terms of scars on buildings downtown, probably the most noticeable is the Artesian Bottling and Manufacturing Company, what's now the Dr. Pepper Museum, uh, built in 1906 by Milton W. Scott, a local architect. Um, and that building sustained some pretty heavy damage in the storm. The upper floors of the main building there uh, were largely destroyed. May is right in the middle of the most important time to produce soft drinks in the time. So May to September is your heaviest sales time. And so they knew they had to repair quickly. So they basically found what they could to patch up the holes, get the roof back on that part of the building and move on with what they needed to do. So the brick that's used to fill that hole on the outer wall where the tornado went through is slightly different color, slightly different size. It's a very obvious mismatch. And there's actually almost a half moon shaped scar that shows where that repair had to happen. As you would guess with that big of a storm, communication was nearly non-existent. And with the power lines down, the phone lines down. There were actually stories of people that were downtown that went home and their family didn't even know a tornado had hit that day. Um, so this was pre-TV. Uh, most of the TV stations, KWTX, didn't start until 1955. So the job of getting information out to the public and letting people know about the damage, also calling for National Guardsmen and people to come in to help, that fell on the radio stations. WACO and KWTX were the two radio stations at the time, and KWTX had a reporter, Bob Martin, who was actually on the ground within an hour or two broadcasting and letting people know what the damage looked like and how catastrophic it was, but also talking to people that were downtown working to dig people out of the rubble. We've always wondered what a tornado could bring about, and we look now to the terrific destruction of this giant wind as it hits Fifth and Austin, the direct center of the downtown business section of Waco. And here is a great mass of rubble and debris. The R.T. Dennis Company is completely demolished. And we mean that it is completely demolished. The rubble is not over one story and a half high. And you can imagine what a terrific amount of destruction this wind has rendered. Or half a block down the street of, of uh, Austin Avenue, from uh, Fifth and Austin Avenue, or a half a block down the street, there is no building standing. It is a complete mass of destruction. The automobiles parked in front of the building are destroyed, but more than that, is the possibility of the many dead and injured who are within the building. The uh, clocks of downtown Waco stopped at a uh, quarter until five. And that meant that a great many people were still in the building. Here in the Joy Theater and the Chris's Cafe, Hollywood Taylor's, Harlick's Man Shop, all of these are completely destroyed. There is no building standing. We don't know how many people were in the theater at the time of the wind. We don't know how many people were in R.T. Dennison Company at the time. But it is a great mass of rubble, of brick and mortar, lumber, of twisted signs, demolished automobiles. Surely the greatest disaster that Waco, Texas has ever known. We are walking on a brick wall that uh, is uh, surely eight or 10 feet high bricks eight or ten feet thick and what is under that we do not know we can only imagine what terrific tragedy took place here we cannot say 
We can only walk back through the rubble and the destruction as the rescue workers rapidly dig away the bricks, trying to reach those who are still alive. We're looking down now at, at a worker who is uh, apparently approaching one of the injured persons. This rescue work has been going on for 20 or 30 minutes. Uh, sir, can you can you tell us if there are any alive there? Yeah, then we hear them from right up here. We hear some under them thing, and we're trying to get all them uh, bricks out of here, and women are hot under here, but we, we're trying to do our best to get as soon as possible. Sir, have you carried any dead or injured from the building yet? No, but, but they say there's about 15 or 18 right under this building. This is Cafe Billy. 15 or 18 under, under the building now that the men are trying to reach. You can hear the bricks as they're being tossed from the building as the people gather around in groups at different points beneath this collapsed structure and try to find those who are yet alive and breathing. What a terrific task. Something which only happens in a lifetime, the first tornado in the history of Waco, Texas. And it had to enter the very heart of the city at a time when the people were thronging within the building. We could tell that all hell had broken loose because the debris and the damage was all into the streets, just like a bomb explosion in the war. Uh, and it had, uh, in some cases, uh, had blown out over vehicles and crushed them, automobiles. I saw acts of heroism uh, with people climbing around on this debris of the dentist building trying to help save lives. A great number of people uh, went beyond the call of duty to try to help out. That's one of the things that I think exemplifies the people of Waco after that storm was that they did rush in and sometimes without waiting to see if a structure was safe or if they were going to hurt themselves in the rescue attempt, they would run into somewhere like a Chris's Cafe where there were a number of fatalities and they could see people trapped in the rubble and they would just start throwing bricks aside and pulling people out. They had kind of organized some groups by then, a bunch of us kids that knew each other were organized up and going through some buildings and seeing if we could help dig people out. And uh, that group that had gone to the pool hall down on Franklin Street, there was some kids in there that we knew. It was still kind of rainy and wet and the uh, Salvation Army and the Red Cross set up operations, emergency operations down there. And uh, they were, they had brought a lot of things like raincoats and things like that for people. And of course the military, James Connolly Air Force Base, had a bunch of people come from there that were uh, participating and they provided a lot of security, you know, at street corners and things that assisted the police. It was amazing. A lot of people, a lot of people and, and, and people brought their equipment, their trucks and their uh, bucket lifts and whatever they had that could be used to move debris to get people out. I remember the, I didn't spend a lot of time at the RT Dennis building, but I knew of the operations going on there trying to get those pe people out. And that was a big deal because there was a lot of heavy timbers and things piled on top of people. And they got a lot of them out. We had brick lines, they had a lot of brick lines where we were just passing bricks out and either piling them up or throwing them in a truck that had been brought up for that. And, uh, but the, uh, the timbers, in fact, all the debris was, you know, trucked out of there once it was the heavy stuff moved by equipment, but a lot of hand digging went on in those buildings. And uh, the, the, us kids spent probably more time on the brick lines than any other form of rescue. And, uh, and it was sorely needed at that time, too. You didn't just rush in and begin moving uh, at tons of debris frantically, knowing there was a person underneath there, because that could be, that could be fatal, of course. So it had to be done slowly and gingerly, and, and that's, again, where the, uh, uh, where the amazing aspect of people doing it by hand came in. Unfortunately, there were 114 casualties that day, but reports have it as upwards of 1,200 people went to the area hospitals due to the damage of the tornado to mainly Providence and Hillcrest. Some are taken also to James Conley Air Force Base. But do you think that many people hurt in that short amount of time? It put a strain on the ambulances, and really they were using whatever vehicles they could to get people from the damaged site to the area hospitals. 
someone uh, approached us and uh, said that there were a number of people that needed to go to the hospital and they, there weren't any ambulances available and they saw that we had a station wagon and wondered if we could start taking people to the hospital. So we did. If they didn't have ambulances, they used pickup trucks. They used everything. And there was ambulances coming in from all of the various other places. And we could have called in and we did have a few Fort Hood ambulances and, and military equipment. They were in the hospital rooms were all full. The emergency rooms were all full. The operating rooms were all full. The people laying on whatever they could find in the halls waiting to be picked up and carried in for emergency treatment. After the casualty had been received and the, and the early diagnosis made and they had been sent to the different departments for care, those of us, of course, that were present worked wherever department it was necessary to work. Being a surgeon, I worked in a surgical area. We even had the psychologists and psychiatrists trying to talk to the people who were in shock and mostly in a nervous state, yet had no actual injuries. Not only did we have to take care of the people who were actually in the area of the disaster, but the people who kin or dear friends were in the area and they had no knowledge whether they had been killed or they were still alive. They became extremely sensitive to this disaster and many of them went into shock. Some of them even developed chest pains or nausea and vomiting until we could assure them, you know, or could assure them that their friends or people were all right. Everyone was concerned to help. I remember well that we communicated to see if certain services like orthopedic service, surgical service, was well staffed at both hospitals. And if one hospital had too many, then one or two would gladly go over to the other hospital to work. I am proud to say that only one died after being received in the hospital. The McLennan County Medical Society and it, its members served through all these hours and days without any charge. I never saw such brotherly love, such coordination, such Christian acts as I saw during that time. It made me tremendously proud of Waco. And I was glad that I was just a little part of it and that so many others shared with me in helping those that were less fortunate during this catastrophe. It takes disaster sometimes, wars and disasters, to make us lay aside the superficial differences. And that was an important aspect of the Waco tornado in that without being asked or without any direction at first, after the first immediate shock and people look around and find themselves standing in the midst of the worst tornado in the history of Texas, everybody began to do something. I remember that very vividly, that people of all types, men and women and students and passers-by, laborers and businessmen all out in the middle of the streets, either directing traffic, loading ambulances, digging bodies out with their hands. I, I still have a vivid recollection of bleeding hands when I think of the tornado, because when you just unceremoniously dump all of the contents of a building in a pile, of course, you've got jagged glass and splinters of wood and steel fragments, and there are people without any thought at first just pitched in. It renewed my faith in, in the Waco people that they will put their shoulder to the wheel when a disaster does it. We just had so many volunteers, sincere volunteers, that it was impossible to use them all. Everybody wanted to volunteer. I'm talking about food, money, equipment, time. When you look back at the numbers from the May 11th, 1953 tornado, it's staggering to even hard to comprehend. 114 deaths, over 600 significant injuries from that storm that day. But then you look at the property damage, 600 businesses and homes completely demolished, over a thousand damage due to that. And some businesses were damaged so much or so much of their management were lost in the tornado, they never operated after that. Uh, the RT Dentist Company, where the mo most of the deaths were, all except for one of their management were killed that day. And when you look at the amount of damage done and you put in perspective of today, you're talking about a half a billion dollars in damage. It's hard to even comprehend. But you know, the, the big story was is just that how much people didn't expect this to happen, how they were caught off guard. They were just kind of in their normal day-to-day -day activities. And in a snap of a finger, thousands of lives were changed, whether it was loss of family members or you know, injuries due to it or damage that was occurred. So it was a, a devastating storm. 
and you can still see some of the the scars just walking around downtown Waco you know the the Dr. Pepper Museum has that scar there you can see, but there's there's a lot of parking lots downtown that never were there before the tornado. You stand at the corner of 5th and Austin right next to the Alico building. That parking lot is where the R.T. Dennis building stood. Uh, Chris's Cafe, the Joy Theater, where the, most of the deaths occurred right there in that block. But, you know, the biggest thing that I took away, you know, yes, there was a lot of death and destruction. Yes, it was a very sad story, but just the heart of the people of Waco, that you had the most devastating storm ever to roll anywhere around here, and honestly in the state of Texas, and how quickly neighbors and uh, military and National Guard came running in to try to do everything they could. They honestly had too many people run into downtown Waco wanting to help that it nearly caused a problem trying to get people out. So I think that signifies really the heart of uh, the people of Waco, that they're willing to drop everything risk their lives to go dig through rubble to try to save other people. And there were countless numbers of lives saved that way. And then another thing that we really take away from the storm is how much better warnings from tornadoes are. There's a lot of people that say the 1953 Waco tornado really shifted the way that tornado forecasting and radar technology and the use of those radars changed across the country due to the damage and destruction. And fortunately, even with big, strong tornadoes now, with the warning network we have and the ability to tell people that storms are coming and the better constructed buildings, we don't see that style of damage and destruction with storms nowadays. It was described at that time as the monster from the sky, and I think that's an accurate description of it.